What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning The Dr. Vibe Show. I have hosted and produced over 2,000 epic conversations over the last 10 years. And what makes our conversations epic? We don't do interviews. We do conversations. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe Show. As always, I like to say you're blessed highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. Also know I'm a certified empowerment coach and president and CEO, CEO of Express Your Vibe Coaching and Communications and a few other things, but we'll get to that stuff later because it's not about me, and especially today, it's not about me, and I'll get to that in just a moment. We have the youngest person who is a regular on the Dr. Vibe Show, Home of Epic Conversations with us tonight. And check this out. It's the man's birthday, and he wants to hang out with Dr. Vibe. And he don't even live in the same country as me. So I don't know. I don't know what what what, it, what I'm all about, but he said he wanted to do it when he booked it. And then he told me it's his birthday. I go, really? I said, okay. No problem. It's all good. So uh, we are always blessed and highly favored to have Alexander Williams back on the Home of Epic Conversations, the Dr. Vibe show. And uh, how you doing, my man? What's been going on? I'm doing quite well. I mean, the whole reason why I decided to book this on my birthday was because I couldn't imagine a better birthday present than getting a chance of having an epic conversation with the great and masterful Dr. Vibe. So I'm doing fantastic, and I uh, really appreciate you having me on here. Well, the pleasure is always mine, and the mic is always open. Uh, for people who have not seen you on or heard you on the Dr. Vibe show before, can you give a little background about yourself? Yeah, I am a writer out of the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, go banana slugs always. Um, and I am a community advocate uh not nearly to the success that you are uh been displaying but uh you know every day is a constant battle and i just strive to you know get a little better each and every day and just try to build upon legacy that's uh i think going to be one of the key words for our podcast today um well, okay i just and, want uh, i just i just want to interrupt you you are quite younger than i am <laughs> and and you've got more hair than I do, at least on your head. And, <laughs> and, uh, and but so at your age, why, and we're not even getting to our main conversation yet, but this strikes me and I, I want to get you to give some thought process to our audience on your birthday. Why is legacy important to you? Well, I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot and I really like that you asked the question the way that you did, because I think back to when I turned 23 last year, it's, and for some reason, when I woke up this morning, it was just fresh in my mind. And I think back to what have I really done in that past year that has added to my legacy? Like, what have I accomplished? Who, what are the people that I have touched? You know, the, you know, the lives that I've altered or, you know, the things that I've been able to produce. And I think as I get older, that's something that becomes more and more urgent. I feel a stronger undercurrent in everything that I do that there's this really pressing matter of urgency. And I think as I just kind of move along just today and I think forward, I have to always be conscientious of that and how that is going to add to this, to my legacy and, you know, to that, to the idea of legacy. And so I think that when we take that into a more macro level of thinking, that that's a thing that a lot of people think about. And sometimes people can get crushed under the weight of those thoughts and kind of forget their own way in things. Okay. Just out of curiosity, do the, do the people you associate with have that sort of thought process also? Yeah, I mean, I try to keep a company around me of people that are never satisfied. And I, I mean, I don't mean never satisfied and that they're never satisfied with, you know, who they are or, you know, the world that they live in. But they're never satisfied with not giving 110 percent or they're not satisfied with being complacent. You know, I, I really try to keep a company of people that have goals, you know, whether that's just 
a daily one, a monthly one, a, a personal one, an academic one, just someone that wants to really strive for something because if you're around people that don't seek some type of success, whether that's personal or otherwise, then you're not advancing towards something. You know, you're just staying stagnant. And I mean, I don't know about you, but I think complacency will kill you a lot faster than anything else, my friend. Oh, hey, I, I receive that. As I say, one of the things I always <laughs> I always say to people and I'd rather be dead than bored. Uh, <laughs> at least death is exciting, you know. Get to finally see what the other side is like. <laughs> uh, no, man, I, I'd rather be dead than bored. And I, and you can tell that from our pre-chat that I'm not bored. Oh no, you have plenty, plenty going on. And absolutely, I mean... plenty of positive going on. So that's a little bit about <sighs> Mr. Alexander on his butt day. Now, you picked, and this is interesting, you want to talk about this subject, which is not a light one, no. on your birthday. <laughs> the role of rap and its function in dismantling right, white supremacy. So I want to break down some things first. What mm -hmm. is your association thought process when it comes to white, um, to con not white supremacy, rap music first? What's its role? Well, to, what's it? What's its role today compared to when you first started listening to it? I think the role is the same. I think people and media just try to continue to portray it differently. Uh, for me, the way that I was kind of, I guess, brought into rap, you know, from the people that sh first showed me music, like my father, my grandmother, uh, different, you know, mentors and. Uh, older friends and uh, other people from the black community that I came from, I think it was always about going against an unchecked authority. Rap was always something about expressing this like personal trauma that you needed to not only get out because it was like kind of harboring something within you, but it was harboring something from all the lives that you touched as an individual. And I think that that's still this been the same undercurrent as rap. I think it's just the way that the me media tries to make people consume it and facilitate it through channels is what's di being different. And I think that's just a change as our culture changes, uh, the way that we access cultures change and the way that we consume culture changes. Because, I mean, culture, whether or not people realize it, it's a commodity. It's, it's an actual product. And so, like any other product, it can be modified, it can be improved upon, it can die. And I think that as people kind of forget those notions, then, then we kind of go into the real trouble about rap. Okay. So then let's get your thoughts on white supremacy, which is uh, something that has become more and more in front of the cameras, in front of people's faces over the last year, year and a half, for whatever reason. We don't need to go there. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but, but, and how, and take a look at over the last few years where it was basically something we didn't hear about to now, which almost become a regular news item. What mm -hmm. are your thoughts about white supremacy today? Well, and so this, this kind of ties back to what I just said about culture being a product, right, and uh, the way that we access it being different. So white supremacy now is kind of like a hot button item in a way. It, it's kind of like a way for people to get clicks on their articles because either you have one person that rejects the notion of white supremacy and they're likely to click on it to see, oh, well, you know, this obviously, this goes against my worldview, so these people are idiots. Or you're going to get a person that will click on it because they're like, yeah, this reinforces notions that I already thought to be true. Now, when we think about white supremacy and its relationship to rap, the two are interconnected as peanut butter and jelly are interconnected. Rap, the way that it is constructed as a literary and musical tradition has always been intertwined with the system of white supremacy in the United States. And I think that's really the main positive aspect of rap that people forget. Okay. And that we need to keep in mind as we consume it. Okay. So we've looked at both those items separately. Now let's start meshing them together. Why do you feel that rap music can counteract white supremacy? 
Well, here, I would like to just read you. So the reason why I chose this topic specifically and the reason why I'm so passionate and uh, interested in it is because I plan to write about this as my dissertation. So when I was an undergraduate at the UC, uh, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, my senior thesis was a rap album. And I did that because I figured I could write what I wanted to write in an academic essay, if I, I could I could take all that content, all of those, you know, literary criticism, that literary tradition that I'm uh, utilizing as a writer, and I could just apply that through the medium of rap. It, it would be the same thing as if I just wrote a 30-page paper. I just decided to do it as a rap album. Now, when we think about white supremacy and its relationship to... Uh, Rap, I would like to read you just a little bit of kind of like my thoughts for uh, what I've been writing for my dissertation. Sure, go ahead. So this is just, I'm just reading from the abstract. So this isn't, you know, me and potatoes. I'm just trying to give you, you know, a really nice, concise summary of the points that I'm trying to get at. The characterization publicly perceived of the successful black rapper in the United States is for all intents and purposes, a social experiment born out of a comprehensive literary and musical tradition. The construct of such a complex figure is primarily rooted in the trauma the African American experienced within the United States and the consequential historical fallout between different racial populations. The rapper persona is a cultural response to the oppressive societal constraints present throughout the history of the United States, including white supremacy, Eurocentric masculinity, and institutional racism. The analytical race theory presented by writers such as Franz Fanon, Amiri Baraka and Harold Cruz serve as the critical undercurrent of the rap genre and a fundamental component of its interaction with mainstream media. A formidable force against social oppressors, the archetype of the rapper simultaneously operates as a messiah, superhero, and social pariah that weaves through different social and cultural spheres. Because the foundation of rap is based within African American social and cultural agency, rappers are essentially community advocates with a platform generally unavailable to people of color. The emotional rhetoric of rap is built upon the urge to dissent against an unchecked authority, whether this authority be universal, personal, or societal. The lyrics stemming from the successful black rapper build upon the tropes and traditions of past mentors and predecessors, while simultaneously experimenting further with the genre's limits and constraints. Characteristics exhibited by the rapper Alter Ego do not necessarily reflect the characteristic of the poet writing the lyrics, as often the rapper Alter Ego uh, represents a symbol much larger than the poet's individual existence. Now, I realize that's a lot to unpack right there. Yeah. But, <laughs> <laughs> just a tiny bit, you know. But uh, so much of that is important. Now, and, and the really great analogy that I can kind of, that I try to, tell people so that they understand is we all are familiar with Bruce Wayne, right? And we all are familiar that he has an alter ego as Batman. Now, as a man and as an American citizen, Bruce Wayne may represent something that Batman does not or will not. And that's because when Bruce Wayne dons a costume, he literally becomes a different persona that exists outside of Bruce Wayne. Other people have been Batman, and that's fine. But just because Bruce Wayne does something doesn't necessarily mean that that will transfer over to the Batman persona. And the goals that each persona has doesn't necessarily have to be, I guess, exclusive of the other. So when a person is saying, I don't like this rapper because they're misogynistic, mm -hmm. what you're really saying is that you don't like the persona that this rapper has created with this social experiment. Because... As we know, people can act differently within different spheres of their lives. A, you know, a person that's really kind and nice in public can be an asshole if you actually know them as a person. And so I think that's something that people forget, is that these alter egos that rappers create are, don't necessarily reflect them as an individual. It's, it's mostly, okay, this is the type of persona I think can work as a social experiment because this is what I'm trying to accomplish with my music, or this is what I'm trying to dictate about the trauma the African American experience and how another person relates to it or how another person consumes it. That is what defines the relationship or you know your liking, quote unquote, to it. Okay, 
I'm going to really peel this down in a number of different segments here. So I'm going to first take a look at rap music. Mm -hmm. The image that a number of rap music artists portray, many would say, is not the best for black, uh, black, best for or best of black culture. So I would like you to respond as people would say, okay, why do we need, what, is rap music the best thing that can counteract white supremacy when it doesn't even portray the best of black culture and black society? I would say that we do because the, of the amount of renown and I don't want to say voice, but the amount of power that's given to rappers. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of rappers are some of the, like, the most famous people on the planet. Like The amount of platform and access that someone like Drake, for instance, has been able to ascertain throughout his career is just incredible to think about it. Like This man can go to Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, China, Brazil, and the United States and be just as known throughout all those different countries. Okay. Now, if you think about that in terms of the different cultures and the different issues that are affecting black communities there, that's astounding the amount of influence he could will if he wanted to get something done in those communities. So it's not just, okay, this is a rapper and what he's saying in his music isn't necessarily being the best reflection of black people and their wants. It's, a, it's recognizing that people listen to him, that he demands a media attention. Okay. He demands okay. action. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna go away at your your thought process, and I'm not because I may or may not agree. But there's things that I want to hear have, have you comment on. Mm -hmm. Rightly or wrongly, the what most people get when they see rap music is not the positive. That's a whole conversation in, in itself on who controls what gets out there. Someone like Drake may be able to relate to a certain demographic, but then there's another demographic that has won't pay attention to a Drake mm -hmm. because they will, and probably, and just generalize, a lot of older people say, this Drake guy, he doesn't represent me. How, you know, like when it comes to combating white supremacy, I don't want, I think there are better people out there other than Drake, whether in rap music or in general, to combat white supremacy. And I would say to them that that's, that's what the beauty of rap is, right? That it's each individual trying this social experiment for themselves. So it doesn't necessarily take, it doesn't necessarily take someone like Drake to achieve the certain things that we want Drake to achieve. It just takes us as a community to recognize what we can do with this kind of power. And that's why I distinctly put in that word uh, messiah, superhero, and social pariah because a rapper can simultaneously be all three of those things to one person. A person may have great disdain for a rapper but recognize that through this rapper's influence that this rapper has a chance of actually cultivating something good for their community. And that's kind of like the, the power of choice and influence that we, we, we need to recognize when we kind of really try to dissect what responsibility rappers have in dismantling white supremacy. Okay, now that's, and, uh, and you're reading my mind here, regards to responsibility. Do you feel that performers like Drake and other mm -hmm. rap artists... Are they committed in their hearts to deflate white supremacy, or are they just doing it because it sells more music in their lyrics? With their lyrics, just sells more music. Now, I mean that's that's kind of different because now when we try to really answer that question, a lot of the times we try to put ourselves in the position of the rapper, you know, and if we kind of try to assume certain things about the rapper, then we can kind of misconstrue you know, what we take as lyrics to be kind of the 
founding text of like what the social experiment is supposed to represent. But, but that's so, what, but that's what all many people all we get what many many of the public get. That's all they get is the lyrics. They don't see anything else. That's all they get, the lyrics and the videos. They don't get anything else. They don't see anything else. Well, but I mean that's kind of also on the responsibility of the consumer. Because for me, when I listen to a rapper, I try to also see who this person is outside of their access to the social sphere. I try to look up interviews. I try to look up where did they grow up? What kind of schools did they go to? What were they interested in? Because then you start to understand the different aspects of rap, that it's a literary tradition. It's a musical tradition. These people come from different trees of rappers themselves or poets. And so once you start piecing in where they're feeding in this literary and musical canon, then you can kind of get a much more elaborate picture of who they are, not as people, but as uh, but as what their persona kind of fits into the overarching like tree. The only concern I have with that is I think you are the minority in the fact that you actually delve into more than the music. You find out where they went to school for lack of a better better term, you 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 look and see how conscious they are. Yeah, and, no, I mean, I, and I, I, I try I, to understand who they are as people because that has so much more impact than just what kind of thing you can consume from, like a, a music video that only you know tradition that has them dancing with like with women. Like you can, you could probably get so much more out of them just speaking to someone random for ten minutes than you could just listen to a whole album because you can actually see the way that they the words that they use, the you know, inflection in their voice, the kind of accent that they may have. You know, like you start to understand that there's other things just beneath this thin veneer that you only have access through to their music. You have to really try to understand that there's so much more beneath the surface. Well, and you and I know that, fully understand that, but, again, I just have this thought process with the masses, they don't go there. Many years ago when I had hair, I used to work for a major company, and most most people don't go that deep. But what is changing is, is there is the world of social media now. Yeah. So that is sort of, how can I put, putting a check on performers, artists, whether rightly or wrongly, they're being checked out now. Uh, you know what I need? I needed to move your screen, your camera down a little because oh, yeah. we can't see. I'm your sorry. Okay, that's I, my uh, laptop is actually dying of power, and I forgot where my charger is, so I'm frantically looking at it no <laughs> before my laptop problem. just shuts we will, off. Uh, we'll, we'll get what we can in. So, good. so just out of curiosity, how much power do you got left? I, ha I am not sure. That's why I'm like, okay. Is there a way that you can kind of just kind of say your thoughts and yeah, I can be yeah, right Yeah, you know back? what? We'll, we'll we'll make this a tight conversation here. So, so let me ask you then, what ways do you feel that rap music can combat white supremacy? I think white. I think rap music can combat white supremacy when people realize the beauty that rap music has to offer. You know, when Biggie Smalls made Ready to Die, why did he actually make it? It's easy to say, oh, well, he made it because he wanted to make money. He wanted to achieve this. He wanted to do that. But he literally made an album called Ready to Die. As a black man, I think that speaks volumes to the type of viewpoint that he had, seeing the type of environment that he was in, seeing the type of seeing the type of culture that he came from and that he was bred through and saying, I'm practically ready to die because of all of these different historical uh, factors that led to my birth, that led to me producing this. And I think that when people recognize the amount of power that that creativity has, then they can really channel that into community building. They can channel that into emotional intelligence for their uh, black brothers and sisters, that they can use that emotion and that intelligence behind all of that to further channel that into actual productivity and to actual, you know, uh, changing the legislature and like so many more facets of our society that we need change. Well, the, as I said, I, and I'm sticking on this opera, the only con one of the current concerns I have is that what, what they're saying, what they're portraying is not having in some areas the best effect on the black environment itself. So I just feel that 
if it isn't having a positive effect on the black environment, it's even going to be a bigger challenge or it gives a counterpunch for white supremacists saying, hey, look at what you're saying about your own environment, your own people. You get yourself, check yourselves out before you're trying to tell us about white supremacy. One other quick point that I've been thinking about since the beginning of this conversation, it's very interesting that rap music and white supremacy, the faces of both are men. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know, we, I think that may be another conversation itself because it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a clash between men and where do the women, if anywhere, fit in this conversation? Because the face of rap music, rap videos, is mostly men. The face of white supremacy, mostly men. And the history, the history of white, some white men having challenges about a thoughtful, pro, or a, and not in a, in a negative way, a progr uh, an aggressive in a positive way, black men. That is a battlefield right there that's been going on for years. And yeah, no, and then, and that's a whole another conversation that we need that we you know we can dive into. But that's 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 really what's the most important thing about that is recognizing how all of this fits together right and how all of this is packaged because of these different historical events that actually led us to have this conversation in the first place like if the slave trade didn't happen in the united states would rap have happened we don't know because rap is such an inherently black thing to be born from all of this trauma and that's really what's the most powerful thing about it is that it's a response to trauma that can be cultivated in a positive way okay well you know what I think to be safe, we'll end it right there because you don't know where your power cord is and I don't want us to go poof in the middle of an epic conversation. Uh, I'd like to thank you for taking time on your birthday. You know, maybe what I'll send you for your birthday is a power cord. Maybe that's your birthday gift for me. <laughs> I have it. I just don't. I can't. Oh, my God. It's, all, so it's okay. It's, it's okay. <laughs> it's not like you're not going to be on again. It's A-OK. -okay. Now, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Uh, you can follow me at Twitter on Dan the Malformed. Uh, I have a Huff Post uh, blog that you can follow, just Alexander Williams Huffington Post blog. Follow me there. Uh, get me at Facebook. And okay, so there we go. We we lost Alexander. His his computer went gone on us. So what we will do is just switch up here. Yeah, we uh, we have lost them, unfortunately. So we'll just go to myself. So that is it. That is all we caught him just as he was uh, signing off there. So I am Dr. Vibe here. I am the host of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I am the host of Epic Conversations, and the Dr. Vibe show is the home of Epic Conversations. If you want to catch replays of my Epic Conversations, YouTube-wise, you're at the place. If you want to catch them, via audio uh, replays, you can go to my website address, the dr, v -I -B -E -S -H -O -W com. You can also go to a number of platforms such as Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Tuned In Radio, Google Play Music Store, and also iTunes, not iTunes, uh, I, um, Tuned In Radio. I remembered it. I was getting really good at this and I just bleep. So, also, do note that I'm a brand ambassador for the only online magazine dedicated to African Americans in, to, in food, wine, and travel. That's called Cuisine Noir Magazine. Now, if you want to check them out online, it's CuisineNoirMag.com. Also, I'm a certified empowerment coach, president and CEO of Express Your Vibe Coaching and Communications. If you would like a complimentary 30-minute session, please touch base with me via Twitter at dr, V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W. You can email me, dr, period, V-I-B-E, at the, dr, V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W dot com. Or you can go to my website at address, the, dr, V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W dot com and fill out the content and information on the contact page. That is it. Oh, one other thing I keep on forgetting. New service offering from Dr. Vibe. Just started something called Getting Media Coverage. And if you're a, a business or an entrepreneur and you're wanting to get some media coverage, I can help you out in regards to press releases. And uh, I've got to do a separate broadcast on just getting media coverage. But what I do with getting media coverage is I help businesses and entrepreneurs obtain media coverage so they can get 
more exposure of their business or service via the media. So finally, three last things. Remember, some t um, live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Also, sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. And finally, well, actually two things. Tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time, that's going to be on November 7th, have Laurent Barton, who is a regular of the Dr. Vibe Show. He recently wrote an article called Men and Vulnerability. That is going to be live on the YouTube channel tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. So finally, God bless, peace be well, keep the faith, and thanks for checking this live or on the replay. It's appreciated and not taken for granted. Good night. What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning The Dr. Vibe Show. I have hosted and produced over 2,000 epic conversations over the last 10 years. And what makes our conversations epic? We don't do interviews. We do conversations.